shoot. The secret to effective medical communications is in careful planning and delivery of information. The world of medicine today is fast paced. It is performed by teams of people who often have little actual contact with one another or many times have never met. Conversations between team members are often by phone or radio. In the future, we will probably have a period of computer keyboard interactions which will eventually change to picture phones. Until then, many of our interactions will be frustrated by the lack of visual input. We will continue to have most of our team communications by phone. In today's fast-paced and often impersonal medical world, the key to good patient care teamwork is being able to convey the necessary data in a style that maximizes good information but minimizes time wasting. Let's talk with Dr. Donald Bowles, the Phoenix physician who designed this video, and ask him more about effective medical communications. Dr. Bowles, how did you come up with the idea to present this video? I've observed a steady decline in the quality of our medical communications and the deterioration in medical teamwork and patient care that has resulted from our carelessness. Fortunately, I observed something some years ago which I think is a solution to our problem. In fact, I'm rediscovering the technique more than actually inventing it. Well, what is the problem with our communications? As medicine attempts to perform a team function with team players that are often unknown to each other, we're forgetting to bring each team player up to speed. Don't forget that medicine today is often fast and at high volume. The team players are stressed, and patient demands and friction amongst the team players make matters more stressful. We are also in an environment with the pressures of managed care. There are larger medical groups and companies with more anonymous members. There is less chance today that the team members are aware of the important facts regarding the patient they are treating. So are we still treating a single patient? That's right, but it is often no longer the domain of the single practitioner who may have had a historical knowledge and continuity of care of the individual. How far does this problem go? Today's management team may include many doctors, nurses, emergency medical personnel, hospital techs, hospital insurance representatives, and social workers. The list of people that influence the medical care of one individual may literally be too long to mention, but they all have a role and need to be well informed about the patient. How do you propose to solve such an enormous problem? Back in medical school and residency, we learned a style for case presentation. For example, after we'd been up all night working on call in the hospital on emergency medical service, we had to drag ourselves into an early morning meeting with the professor and our fellow students to explain about each of our hospital admissions from the night before. Then came about an hour of friendly and not so friendly criticism. Sounds grueling. Well, it was pretty obvious who had sleep and who didn't. The only way to survive the meeting was to be really well prepared and to be short and clear in the presentation. And you had some format to follow? There was a clear format for arranging the data and basic sequence of events. I think some people became so lazy about mental processes that they became terrified by the mere mention of memorization, let alone practicing it. So, aim and shoot is a mnemonic or memorization tool? Yes, it means careful preparation before taking a clean shot at verbal delivery. When you shoot a gun, you don't just pull the trigger without carefully preparing to hit the target. Most of the work is in preparation, while the action of shooting takes no time. Effective medical communications is much harder than that. Will you show us how it's done? Yes, but before I do, I'll show you how it's not done. Hi, Don. This is Audrey down here at the ER tonight. Yeah, one of your old ladies came in. Um, yeah, I know who you know who I'm talking about. She's a cute old lady. Um, just can't find the chart right now. Um, anyway, I think she's in her 60s. Yeah. Um, damn it, where is that chart? Um, anyway, she came in complaining of some chest pain, so I went ahead and ran an EKG on her and uh, did some labs. EKG looks like it's probably okay. I just can't... Where, just, I, I think the tech still has it. Um, anyway, so... Um, Labs are still coming back. I don't have all of them back yet. And, um, you know, basically the family just wants her admitted. So, uh... Anyway, can you get that chart for me on 2A, please? Tonight would be nice. Data should be taken from the medical records or the facts at hand in a specific format. 
Mrs. Jones is a 63-year-old white female. Next, we follow with a very brief problem description. Mrs. Jones is a 63-year-old white female with a 20-minute episode of acute chest pain. Next comes the most difficult part of the presentation to be researched and prepared. This will take repeated practice, but in that respect, it is like anything else that is worth learning and mastering. This step will also give us the essential background necessary to know the patient well and enable us to approach tough questions with confidence. We are going to look for and prepare a past medical history from the available medical data or have to assemble a history from questioning and the facts at hand. We will begin by saying the past medical history includes and then assemble a list of prior medical problems. We will follow a few logical guidelines in this preparation. We will start with the current problem system from large problems to small problems. Next, we will give any other major medical diagnoses or conditions which may not be immediately applicable to today's situation. Next, we will give any minor problems in the history. We will finish with any medication allergies. One other tip for a polished past medical history. This problem summary should be pertinent to the current complaint, but should also provide pertinent negatives. That is, it must address logical data that would be expected, but is not present. Her past medical history includes hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, previous MI with cabbage in 1994, morbid obesity, 50 pack year smoker, but without known diabetes. Next, we give a current medical history, which is a little like telling just what's happened recently regarding the main problem. Specific medical problems have fairly stylized formats for these histories. You will learn this from reading specialty journals, especially those involving case presentations. The best examples are in the New England Journal of Medicine. You will also learn from listening to most case presentations. This will take time and experience to learn and master. It should be a conscious part of your professional formation. A classic pattern history is often heard regarding chest pain and myocardial infarction. 20 minutes ago, she had an acute onset of crushing retrosternal chest pain at rest with radiation to the left arm and jaw with diaphoresis, dyspnea, nausea, no vomiting, and tachyarrhythmia. She took sublingual nitro three times with no relief and called 911. She is pain-free now with 4 milligrams MS, sub-Q, and O2. EKG shows Q waves and precordials and enzymes are pending. After the data collection, we will always return to our need or purpose. Let's review what we have learned for data preparation for an effective medical communication. The first chunk of data we prepare consists of name, age, race, and sex. This should be easy and should become second nature to us to think this way. Next, we go to a very brief description of our chief problem. Next, we prepare our past medical history. We go from most important to least important. We include pertinent negatives. We also include medication allergies. Next, we give a current medical events history. Assessing, building, and clarifying are important steps in preparation. And the speaker is ready to go on automatic while sounding authoritative and intelligent. I think the fears connected to self-esteem and confidence are well conquered by this technique and the information guides the listener to the consensus solution of meeting or need. When I hear the paramedics talk on their radios, for example on a TV program, I notice that there is almost a rhythm to their speech. I think that's true. It reminds you of what the psychiatrists call pressured speech. In this case, we are not usually speaking in a purely conversational way. It's telegraphic and not meant to be natural. It's sort of like speed reading. We're trying to get through a lot of technical information, and the listeners should feel free to stop us if they feel need for more clarification. So we go fast, but we're able to stop on a dime? Yes, and I think we should be light enough on our feet in this conversation that we recognize when we are receiving new information that also should be included in our data. Maybe we should call that reloading? Let's just say that if we break down the medical communication into aim and shoot, we will remember that good preparation precedes good delivery. Dr. Bowles, you have described the process of medical communications as aim and shoot. 
You teach a simple process of medical data preparation and a format for medical data delivery. Can it really be so easy? No. As long as there are different kinds of people, there will be attitudes to overcome. We're likely to encounter resistance from a variety of sources. Of course, if we learn to deal with those types of individuals, we will be successful in meeting our goals. That sounds great. It would really be an accomplishment to get through to people with attitudes. But surely you don't have a format at the ready for those kinds of situations, do you? Actually, I don't have the solutions. Somebody else has already worked it all out. A few years ago, I was having a problem with a coworker, and I just couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. I blame myself for the problems, having convinced myself that I was a terrible manager of people. As a result, I discovered that there exists a whole world of managerial and business books dedicated to solving problems in the workplace. Some of those techniques apply to problems in the home and in relationships as well. I simply needed to open up to those suggestions and take the time to apply them. There are some wonderful books written by authors Bramson and Brinkman that deal with strategies for dealing with difficult people. How does it work? They basically look at common types of difficult people and then apply proven strategies for getting through to them. What kinds of difficult people are we dealing with? Well, one of the most interesting features I found while studying this problem was my realization that the difficult people in the medical world fall into very few types. That makes for relatively few types and relatively few new strategies to be learned. Let me show you what a behavioral model looks like and you'll see what I mean. So what are we looking at? This is a model based on people's orientation on making communications. They tend to be either task-oriented or people-oriented, and their style tends to be either mostly aggressive or passive. I don't think the passive ones are the problem. Exactly. They might exist in certain companies or families, but they aren't typical of the most obnoxious people that we encounter in medicine. I don't suppose they're too much the people-pleasing, wannabe-liked kind, either. Right again, meaning that most of the really difficult kind fall into the upper right-hand corner of the wheel. They are aggressive and task-oriented. To be fair and a little empathetic, they're action-oriented, stressed, short on time, and need to get things done. I think medicine attracts certain people to it, and it molds others to its own reality so they tend mostly to be that one type. We will also find some difficult people in medicine are attention-seeking types, but they are probably more commonly found in academic medicine. So what are these types of difficult people that you're talking about? Are you ready to meet a few? Of all the useless, stupid people, what does it take for you to catch on to such a simple solution? Any fool could see it. I demand to speak with your supervisor, and when I'm finished, you may not have a job to return to. Ouch, what was that? That was what Bramson and Brinkman have both termed the tank. And that is about 90% of the difficult people you will find in medicine, from both the professional and the patient side of the picture. But what an awful tirade. Yes, but it becomes habitual for some people, simply because it works. I suppose it shows the real picture on the aggressive, task-oriented, difficult person, get the job done. But it's a simple black and white kind of world, and would it be simpler if people saw it their way? Yes, and it would also be the preferred mode for all of us if we simply wanted to be effective. But since it is so demeaning to the listener, it cuts off that individual from being part of a team approach. I get it. You said that medicine works today in complex teams. Right. And this one can't be part of any team system. This one can't be trusted as a team person. So what is the strategy for the tank personality? First, we have to remember a few basic pointers regarding this tank type. They can't be defeated, or at least they can stand losing. They will respect those that stand up to them. Looking meek and mild or sounding that way on the phone is not going to work with them? No, that's just giving them a license to kill. And since they can't stand losing, remember that the object is not to win. It's not? No, the object is cooperation, or at least try to achieve an objective of future cooperation. And that means not giving in to the temptation to become tanks ourselves. We need to remember our goal. 
which is cooperation rather than winning. All this so they can save face? Exactly. Our goals are to command respect and achieve cooperation. You can't win a shouting match with these people. Even if you could, in some circumstances you would find yourself out of a job or passed up for promotion or any number of unpleasant consequences could follow. If we are actually in the room with them, we need to stand up straight. Remember that our actions will speak louder than words. Look them in the eye. Take a deep breath. In fact, you should practice intentional breathing. Get them to slow down. Get them to sit down. And if they won't sit down, then remain standing with them. It sounds like we're killing time here. We are. Because whether we are in the actual room with them or on the phone, our first positive action is to let them run out of steam. Or run out of ammo if they're tanks. We might also go for the guided imagery approach. What's that? We imagine them as wind-up toys running out of energy. Or we imagine ourselves as our favorite superhero standing up to the bad guy. Sort of a Clint Eastwood, Stallone, Schwarzenegger, Van Damme, Chuck Norris kind of image. Without the violence, of course. Next, we try for the interrupt. I might think at that point to try to be witty. This person is not acting with wit at that point. I was thinking of a more simple mantra, like just repeating their name again and again. And with the proper form of addressing them, I assume. Yes, I don't mean that we should stoop to name calling here. Then what? We assume the I statement while stating our opinions forcefully. And if we can't get them to come around? We try to suggest a friendly future cooperation. Do they ever come around on the first try? Yes, they often do. They often run out of ammunition and begin to respect their worthy opponent. But sometimes it is very difficult for the person who has been the object of a tank attack to be ready to be friendly after so much abuse and adrenaline. We have to be careful not to lose it with anger ourselves. And remember our goal of cooperation, not to defeat the tank. What are other types we're likely to meet? The next most common is the sniper. They use a hidden rather than a frontal attack. They are generally sad, put-down artists. I can't believe they let her present this report. I know, maybe we should send an anonymous letter to the boss and let him know what we really think. His comments may be hurled with enough force to hurt, but he hides it in a laugh. He's learned to use social constraints and rituals. He tries to rope everyone into agreeing with him. But they usually do not move others to action, so are rarely successful. They're usually ineffective. Mostly it's embarrassing. But they believe in their own superiority. Their approach is sad and self-defeating, really. They create an impasse and start a cycle of more frequent and frontal attacks. Can they become tanks then? Yes, and that's actually one of the dangers. And the strategy? First, we surface the attack. Are you ridiculing me? Don't you like what I'm saying? Are there more types of difficult people? The last one I'll touch on also comes from the controlling task-oriented variety, the know-it-all. We occasionally run into the type that lectures to us, extremely confident and outspoken. And they are hard to interrupt. The strategy consists of seeing through their lonely, isolating world. Do you turn them into mentors? Yes, but you have to know your stuff. Then you parrot back their main points like a good pupil. We try to blend with their styles. You haven't talked much about blending styles. Blending is an important concept in modern communications technique. With our body language or our voice, we try to gently imitate the other person's style. We stand like them or use similar verbal styles. I find myself unconsciously adopting the accent of people I hear. That's a good example of blending, done instinctively. I think we all do it to some extent. It probably makes us more acceptable by being accepting. 
Another good technique to remember is imagery. We may want to mentally run through our previous bad experiences and think about strategies from today's discussion that would have interrupted those events. It almost sounds like watching a movie. Practicing it as watching a movie, even altering the memory for size or volume or destroying the image, helps to develop a zen-like, impassionate observer persona to get you through very difficult communications. Dr. Bowles, thank you for joining us today to discuss your medical communication alternatives. And thank you for joining us. This is Kathleen Trout hoping you hit your target.